Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Today's special guest is Joy Tanner. You know her as Erin Voss in Lock and Key Season 1. She's back as Erin Voss in Lock and Key Season 2. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Um, hello, Joy. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. I'm a big fan, and I just want to appreciate you joining me. Well, Jeff, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here. And uh, at this time of the season, it's uh, it's just a little more glitter in my life. So thank you so much. It is. I can see the, the, the Christmas in, um, in the background oh. right there. It's festive. <laughs> <The tree down. laughs> no worries. No, um, I sh- my tree is actually in front of me. So it's unfortunately not on camera, but it's actually a pretty nice setup tree. <laughs> That's I, And you've got the green. I see the green yes. behind you and I see all of the awesome... Um, so I have to ask you really quick, is uh, the drawing behind you next to the S on your wall behind you, yep. is that, is that, uh, who is that? Well, um, I, um, during the, um, well, one of my side jobs is an indie comic book writer. <gasps> and I do, uh, everything you see behind me are the comic books that I've written, because apparently I'm vain and this is what I do. <laughs> I put them on my wall. <laughs> um, and the combo and the pictures um, behind me the one with the, the witch is right there. That's uh, from the comic book Nightmare Patrol. It was done by Frankie Washington. Okay. And um, she appears in my Nightmare Patrol comic book. And on the right is Mark, I'm going to get the last name, uh, Matt Skull, I think it is. And he okay. did um, an, uh, just an image for me for a character called Golem, who also appears in Nightmare Patrol. All so right. um, in my vanity, I stick it all on my wall. So Well, I'm digging it. I'm totally <laughs> digging it. I, I collect... So yeah, I like animation art. I'm going to just do this really quick. Okay. Do you see, Mr. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So that is that is right before. Did that make everyone nauseous, Blair Witchy? Oh, Sorry. <laughs> totally. It's okay. Uh, um, yeah. So that's right before uh, the Grinch's heart explodes and becomes becomes oh. big again. Yeah. Oh, that's a real cell? That's real a real cell? cell. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, that is don't so come, cool. Don't come to my house and steal it. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Anyway. No, you're you're anonymous. No one knows where where you live. There you go. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> if they do, apparently there's a there's a nice cell right up there that really looks cool. <laughs> pretty, and I've got dogs, and they may start barking as uh, <laughs> so. Anyway. And, and you're in Canada, where everything is safer. <laughs> That you know what you, you know oh are we gonna play that drinking game where we have to drink if I say Trump is an asshole oh that I'd be so drunk so quickly but okay. you're, you're feel free to to okay. um get me as hammered as you okay. as you want by saying that as many times as you wish okay. and we'll actually put that in the show notes it'll be okay. Joy Tanner lock and key Trump is an asshole Trump is an asshole <laughs> hashtag Trump is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will be one of the most interesting um episodes we've ever had okay there you go just to make things interesting for you jeff but that is so cool that that's an original animation so i mean that that yeah. that show is so incredibly classic oh it's it's iconic it's like a you know R- rankin and and uh I, i'm trying to think of the production company but all of those cartoons those those animated movies from the the 60s like really led the charge for the work that's done now. I mean, it's, you can't even Mm. compare, uh, you know, the sophistication. I mean, I think actors are going to be with AI. They're going to be on their way out at one at one (laughs) time. So I should be quiet. So, (laughs) well, I mean, the, if I remember correctly, it's narrated by Boris Karloff. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes. That is a voice I have wished to God I had when I decided to, I was like, I wish I had the Boris Karloff voice. It's one of the great classics. Oh, wonderful. Just wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. There we go. Anyway. So for you, I mean, obviously, once again, you you love animation, you you loved acting. When when did you decide you're going to be an actress? Oh, uh, well, you know, it was funny because it was later, it was really later in in, uh, my young adulthood, probably in, in school. Um, I had been doing uh, acting as a as a young child in elementary school, um, and it was just something that I really loved to do. Uh, when I ended up at university um, or college, up here they call it university, but when I ended up at, in college, uh, I remember my parents saying um, they were very practical people. 
no theater, no plays. You're here for academics only. Uh, wow. The plan was to be at, at SUNY Potsdam for two years and then head off to Cornell to get into the journalism program and finish up there. Um, and I, I ran into, I met on that first day as my parents are driving away in the station wagon, <laughs> I, I meet a, a, a young woman named Sarah who uh, became a, a lifelong friend. And we were sort of exploring the campus and we saw these posters for um, come audition for Romeo and Juliet. And we were like, oh yeah, let's do it. So, so we did it. And um, I ended up getting cast as Juliet and Sarah oh. got cast as the nurse. And we pissed off a lot of upperclassmen. <laughs> so, and, and that was really it. That, that I think was, um, I went, wow, this is really what I wanna do. But, uh, you know, I, I knew that I also had to have a, a backup plan. I have a, a degree in, um, in English and I was, I was actually working at an ad agency in between school. And I thought that maybe that was something that I would end up doing. Um, but uh, as, as luck would have it, have it my, um, my first teacher at, at Potsdam, her name was Dorothy Gamus. She was from England. She said, you have to get out of here, darling. And, <laughs> and so she found this program. It was the sophomore year for the program. It was the British American Drama Academy. And I kind of just packed my bags and, and showed up uh, my the first semester of my junior year and went, this is seminal. It was mind blowing for me. Mm. And uh, that was really it. So that's when I thought, oh, my path is... I'm going to be a stage actress. This is what I'm going to do. So, you know, that's such like a classic story, especially the idea that your parents drove away like in the Volkswagen. It's, it's not like that classic, like, like, like a Hallmark movie where, you know, like the daughter goes out to college and the family drives around in the, in the perfect family vehicle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, well, you know, it's funny because my dad was in the Navy. He was in World War II. My mom was, you know, stay at home mom for the most part. Mm. You know, it was, it was very idyllic and, you know, very typical of, you know, you know, arguing and, and the usual shenanigans <laughs> that go on in a, in a family. So, mm. but they were very practical people and they, you know, after after like my seventh, well, maybe not that seventh, but after like my fourth or fifth series that I was a, a, a lead or regular in, my mom was still saying, you know, maybe you should go back to school and get a degree in psychology. And I <laughs> psychology. Was like, <laughs> like, yes, yes. Well, it, as it turns out, I ended up, I just got my master's. Like, I, so I had, I actually, she'd be very proud of me. I, <laughs> I ended up going back to school, but you oh, know, wow. 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so. That, that's funny she chose psychology like you know what your your career as an actress has told me that you must pursue psychology to figure out what's wrong with you for well, doing I, acting <laughs> I, I i think there was something behind it for sure so anyway so your master's degree is psychology no no my master's degree is actually in uh the study of theater drama and performance oh so uh yeah so i happened to be doing that at the time that i was filming lock and key which i know we'll get into yes uh at some point so that is so awesome my my day job as a, is an english teacher so ah. so that is right up my alley talking about english and theater and the fact that you um performed as juliet i teach that every freshman year it, it's a great play and that'd yeah. be one hell of a role to perform Oh, you know what? I, I was, I, I, will, I will tell you, there were times that I was on the stage and I was like, I, I was so anxious and nervous that I, I thought I, this would be a good time to just like get off the stage and, and, and pee. <laughs> it, was like, it was, it was a lot of work and, and uh, you know, it, coming from, you know, not doing Shakespeare, that's, that's a whole, it's, it's, a, it was a lot of work. So uh so, so a lot of fun. So what kept you on stage and not peeing? <laughs> the fact that I had a corset and all sorts of other stuff, <laughs> not that that would have gotten in the way, but, uh, oh, I think now would be a good time for Trump is an asshole. <laughs> yes. Okay. So if, yeah, if that was a theme song. We would play it during the, the show. You, you there we go. It. Okay. I've got to stop, <laughs> stop saying that. I have family members who may have voted for him. Oh, I'm God. not sure. But anyway. have, you not, have you not disowned them yet? That's a family is family. <laughs> politics is politics. 
<laughs> never uh, the twain shall meet yeah anyway but yeah so no i i stayed on stage and, and managed to keep it together but it's exciting theater is exciting because you don't know what's going to happen so it's a very different beast than than television and film you know educational experience comes from both the states and also you said like said in oxford is yeah. that how different is that in acting styles between the the, the two countries Okay, so let me let me clarify. So the British American Drama Academy has a, a school in London, okay. and they have a um, they have a, a program at well, I don't know whether they're still at, at Regents College, which is a, a college at Oxford, but um, in the summer they go there, and I, I I went back to get my my diploma there. There there are vast well there are differences in styles the american uh tradition comes from method acting which comes out of the group theater whereas you know the tradition of of acting in in um, the uk is very much technically oriented it's not so much getting involved and in, into the your own messy sort of emotional place mm. that's that is kept separate and i think that it's a, a very healthy way to um to operate as an actor. I mean, the Stanislavski, who's sort of the granddaddy, a Russian, um, he was the, the founder of the Moscow Arts Theater at the turn of the 20th, late 19th, 20th century. And he was asking his students and his, and his actors to, to go into their uh, personal lives and to draw upon their personal experiences. So then you fast forward to the 1950s and Marlon Brando and, and uh, Lee Strasberg and, and, and the, that theater movement, it, it, things shifted. Things, things shifted, I think, because of the technology. Um, the, the, the acting became um, more introspective. And so, so the method acting uh, really worked for that at that time, but people were having mental breakdowns. <laughs> Hence the degree in psychology, which I don't have. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I think that there are better ways. I I teach I teach a Michael Chekhov technique, which is a psychophysical methodology, which really leans into the imagination. So you don't have to go into those personal you know memories, mm. which are also you know they're subjective and and they're they're valuable. You don't want to utilize those. Those are personal. So there, and there is, there's a separation between the performance and, and your, yourself and, and what the audience is also going to uh, get out of the performance itself. So it's connected, but it's also disconnected. It sounds like um, so exhausting those, you know, to act, you know, and kind of draw out your, those emotions out of yourself from your own experience. I mean, that must be so incredibly draining as not just psychologically but almost physically draining to do that it, it, it sounds like the most painful way of trying to perform well it, it's funny because i have students who come in and i always ask them are you here to learn a craft or are you here to become famous because mm -hmm. i can't help you with that there there is a craft and it is a physical i i truly believe that it's a psychophysical experience and, you know, you are exhausted at the end of the day when you put in a good day's work, whether mm. and even on stage, like stage is a marathon. Theater work is, a, is really a, mm. a marathon, um, whereas work on film or television is is more of a sprint. It's it's very intense for a short period of time. So you have to be, you know, you have to be healthy. Mm. A lot of people aren't. But, you know, I, I think. Ideally, you should, you know, physically and mentally and emotionally be healthy to do the work that we do. I get to talk to people who are in the industry about stuff. And it kind of reminded me, I was talking to Andrew Hunt um, a couple of weeks back. He's a director. And he said that one of the people he interviewed, uh, well, that he worked with was, was Guy Pierce. He said okay. the amount of how actors are able to be in that moment and be so emotional and then just turn it off. And it, it's like, it's like, it's the mindset to be able to pull that off is immense. I mean, it's, you call them it's a exhausting. <laughs> they, I, I, I put my unicorn away for the interview. <laughs> the horn, the horn. In, yeah, the, anyway. the horns away. <laughs> put the horns away. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's just incredible that actors can be so much in a moment. And I don't know, how do you not take that home with you? 
Well, I think a lot of people do. I, I think that's why so many people end up in rehab and, and are mm. alcoholics, <laughs> you know, and, and why so many, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, why so many relationships don't, you know, I mean, I think there are other pressures regarding that, but, you know, it's, it's, um, you're play here's the thing. This is the, the, uh, the odd thing we're playing pretend. So it should mm. be the most fun, the greatest thing. And it is, but there's so much pressure regarding, um, financial success for projects. There's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure. And the next best thing, the next, you know, the next hot thing is behind you. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of pressure to, to, to perform and to get it right. And, and, you know, so people, people take this very seriously for a number of reasons, financial reasons, for artistic reasons. Um, but it's, you know, it's the best thing that I can think of to, you know, how I want to make a living. I, yeah. it's, you know, you create a family very quickly. It's, it's really wonderful. So I, mean, I think it's really incredible what you told your students about um, looking for acting. Like, what do you want to be in the craft or you want fame? As someone who has been successful, like you have, how do you define that success? Oh, well, I, I would always describe myself as, uh, and I know I should use gender neutral terminology, but I think the term uh, journeyman actor or journey person actor, uh, you know, I have had, I've been able to play a lot of different types of characters. Mm. I've been able to work in a spectrum, like the, the entire spectrum. I've done commercial work. I've done, you know, voiceover work. I've done uh, a little motion capture stuff, which is a lot of fun. Um, I've done film, television, you know, animation and theater. So I've, I've had that ability to, to cross over in these, in, you know, other areas that where a lot of people, if I were in the States, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that as easily. Um, you know, but if, you know, I, I think that's, I've had that luxury. It hasn't made me wealthy or rich, but I've been able to, I've been able to work fairly regularly. And as a middle-aged woman, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I hope they take me out in a box, you know, I, I, I <laughs> I've been very lucky. So, yeah. Well, it, it, it begs a very important question. Since you have that cell of um, the Grinch, do you have the cells from the animation that you've always done voiceover for a cell from those up from those shows? So that's, an, that's a great question, Jeff. Donkey Kong, I played Candy Kong, which many yes. of you will know. Um, that was the very, I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm correct in this. Someone will know. Uh, <laughs> it was done, it was, uh, it was produced by a, a show called, a, a production company called Nelvana. It was the very first digitally produced animated series Oh wow! Ever so, That's so cool. Yeah. So there were no, there weren't cells Aww. that were created at that point. Um, it was all done digitally, and uh, and there, therein goes. That's why. That's why those cells are so precious because they're they're limited. There are so very few of them, and the artists were so remarkable with what they did. But again, this is another just a different art form. It's 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 uh, it's digitized. So. Well, well, like I said, there's something for hand-drawn art that isn't there for, because you get to have the cell. Like I said, I luckily got a couple from um, He-Man from when I was in the 80s. Oh. I, bought, I bought one of those and Exo Squad. So that, that's where uh. my enjoyment came from. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> but that, that is cool, but you got to do animation, which sounds like a, a dream come true for someone who loves animation so much. Oh, it was, you know what? And, and the way that we did it, see, normally what happens, at least now, you go into a, a recording studio by yourself. And so, again, this is why imagination is so important. You have to kind of hear what your fellow character actors are going to be, how they're going to say the, their lines. But when we did Donkey Kong, we were all in the same studio together. Oh, very cool. So it was like insanity. It was just like, you know, and we were playing off of each other. There's this energetic thing that occurs that's just so special. I was so lucky. I was I was so happy to be a part of that experience. It was, uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So as, um, as, 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 a, as an actress doing voiceover or in person, how much does your performance get affected by the actors in the room or, or in front of oh, you? Like completely. Like really? it, that's that's what it's about. I mean, you may go in having done all of your homework and your, you know, your your work, your rehearsal stuff, but what's you're reacting to 
what's happening in front of you. So you've got to be really flexible in, okay, well, I've rehearsed it this way and someone's giving me this read and it's not what I'm expecting. You better, you've got to be on your toes. Like you have, this is because it's conversation. It's, it's, it's active listening and it's not just listening with your ears. It's, it's a full embodied observational kind of uh, um, experience it's the stuff that we do day to day when we're mm. not, you know, in front of our, our our phones and, you know, and so it's it's all about that other person. Mm. It, it sounds, I mean, I haven't I've never really been a musician, but um, it sounds a bit almost like a jazz kind of thing. Like, do you hear about people talk about jazz? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. I, I think that's a great analogy. So. Oh, points for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, and Trump's an asshole. No, I just feel like throwing oh, that yes. in as, as, as a pause came in. <laughs> For now on, that's how I will start every pause. Okay. Um, but so you also um, got involved in a, one of the, in a fantastic show that me and my wife always watch, um, or uh, called Lock and Key. Yeah, which is just so awesome. And like I said, me and my wife got addicted to it uh, when it first came out, and we're we're so happy when it came back. We're like, finally, something we can binge this week. <laughs> oh, that's that's so wonderful to hear. It was it's such a it's such a beautiful project. Uh, you know, from right across the board, from the art direction, the you know, I mean, uh, of course, the actors and and the stories, but it's such a lush and rich. Mm. Uh, uh, world that they created the, the producers it's just it's phenomenal I was again I'm really lucky to have been a part of it so uh, so how did you get involved in the great show Lock and Key so how did I get well there's a there's a process there's a casting process I have an agent and uh, they he submitted me for uh, this role and I almost didn't go because I, I actually had the flu. I was so sick. Oh. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I showed up all bundled up. I had two lines and it was Dodge. Uh, and, and that was it. And I was like, what is this? I have no idea. Uh, so I auditioned and, uh, and I got hired. And so that's how I, um, that's how I got involved with the, with the project. That dialogue, did you even think about, did you know what the context was of any of it? Uh, so I had a little bit of information about the scene itself, uh, and I'm embarrassed to say that I was not familiar with the graphic novels, the, mm. the Joe Hill and, and the Gabriel Rodriguez uh, graphic novels. So, uh, you know, it was purely, okay, well, this Dodge person is clearly a bad person or a bad guy, a bad demon. <laughs> I'm, I can't move, and I need to impart that this is really important information. I have to save this person from something that I'm not really sure of. So you kind of create in your own mind a, a backstory and, uh, and, and, you know, try and, uh, try and give them the feel of what it is that they, the, the producers needed. So I, I happened to hit it. So. Well, you, you obviously did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so. so, so the, the great thing about Netflix as well is that I feel like Lock and Key was made perfectly for Netflix because, and like maybe some shows are more ep um, episodic, it, Lock and Key, it felt like it's meant to be streamed and watched and binged at once because of how it's set up and how it sort of continues. And because it does work in, I think it's, was it 10 episodes? I think it's 10 episodes yeah, long. Yeah. And it just seems to fit that window perfectly instead of doing maybe a 23 episode stretched fillers, you know, type season. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of it also has to do again with the, the financial model. Mm. Netflix has a very specific financial model and, and therein it, you have to fit in that puzzle piece or, you know, you have to fit within that puzzle. Yeah. Uh, I also think the timing was perfect. We were in the middle mm. of COVID and yes. people were just, they'd had it. They, they've still had it. We're still in the midst of it. And so to be able to disappear into a, a, a fantasy and a family show um, where there's loss and grief that that mm. I think collectively audiences could plug into that mm. into that very clearly. I, I think there are some really great programs or shows that the timing was just not right. So for mm -hmm. whatever reason, there's this confluence of events that this comes together and it just sparks the imagination of, of a collective audience and it's mm. international. It's not just, you know, North America. And I always find that to be so um, 
that also fascinates me. Like, what is it about a, a, a program or a show that makes it to have that international appeal, right? Mm. It, 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 I mean, it's got to do something with just how imaginative of a show it is. I mean, there, there's something to be said, no matter how old you are, about that idea of the fantasy and the keys uh, and the possibilities they allow for you. And yeah, I, this is, I, I think there, every individual, I think, has one key when they're watching the show going, I would love to have access to that key for just one minute, one day. Give me that one. And everyone probably has a different key. Everyone has one that they'd be desperate you know, to have access to just once. And I think Lock and Key just, like, just brings it out and says, you know, for at least a little while, you can have that key and see what happens, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's It was it just, and it, again, like I said, it, it's such a lush and, and, and rich, like the house itself are characters. The keys are characters. Yes. It's not just the actors. They, they did this magnificent job of creating this world that, yes. you know, people could really uh, escape to, you know, uh, the ghost key. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you know, to be able to travel. And, uh, and there are new keys coming up. For season three. Oh, oh, we already know a season three, huh? All right, very cool. <laughs> oh wow, okay. So. That that is fantastic. I, I know. Um, and every time I watch the show, my wife is like, "I want Key House." It's like I gotta get a much better job <laughs> if you want Key House. <laughs> but uh, that house is—I mean, yeah. that's a phenomenal house. I mean, it is it actually a complete house, or is it a set that was built? Do you know? So, so there are th- there are three places. Key House, the original Key House was, um, I think, uh, uh, mocked up from a home in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. I know that they shot, they shot there, which is on the east coast of Canada. Uh, then they built the set itself on uh, at Cinespace, which is our big, one of the big uh, um, places where movies and, and television are filmed. So mm. they they had these unbelievable sets that we worked on. And then they also built an exterior, unbelievable, outside of Toronto and outside of Hamilton, out in the country, they built an actual key house. So it's a facade. And, you know, it's just, it's remarkable what, uh, what they were able to accomplish and the details and the, and mm. the craftsmanship, like the, the, the flooring, the tiling, the, they have stained glass windows with, there's one stained glass window at the top of the stairs and it's a, it's a scene of a boat and there's a little sailor that's fallen off the, the <laughs> boat. I mean, it's, like, it's unbelievable. And each room has its own, you know, character and quality. Like it's, they, they, like I said, I can't speak highly enough of uh, the artisanship of, of mm. who they brought in and the music. I mean, just, it's, you know. I mean, the cinematography is, a, is beautiful. It's a beautifully shot show. I mean, yeah, the cave, um, you know, the, the way they shot the house and everything, it's beautiful looking. Yeah. You so know? Michael, Michael was, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for not remembering his last name. Michael <laughs> is the director of photography. He shot a very dark, uh, moody, um, palette. It was very, very moody. Uh, and, and, and the directors, you know, followed suit, like they knew what, where they had to go with this. So, you know, it's, it's all built into this world that they've created. When, when you were, Given the role of Erin Voss in season one, mm-hmm. where you already hint told that, hey, this is going to lead into season two, you're definitely going to come back. Or was it a surprise when it's like, oh, by the way, we're making season two and you're in it? Well, I there were there were rumors, like I I always assume I'm I don't have the job until I've had my first paycheck. So they they had they had said, you know, this is a, a potentially a recurring role. And I think because the storylines are so precious. They don't want anything to be leaked. They didn't mm. say a great deal. I, so I had no idea uh, the significance that that Aaron, that character would have on driving the storyline. Mm. And so we would get uh, we would get these we would get the scripts, you know, a few in advance. So I, I didn't know. Um, I knew it was important. I knew that, you know, when I came back, but I didn't know really the significance until we got into it. So when you first attempted um, Erin Voss in season one, did you have to develop your own backstory for her and, and what you thought her character came from, or did they at least give you that? Oh, I knew that they did. I knew, okay. I knew what her backstory was. 
Um, I, I know that uh, um, there were some people who were not very happy that I had been cast initially because uh, as I understand it, Erin is a, a character of, uh, she's a, a diverse character. Um, but I think what they ended up doing was hiring a um, uh, oh, beautiful actress who played Ellie. Um, and she had more of a, a significant role than Erin did in season one. So I think that they felt that they balanced it out. Um, I knew that she was, uh, what her story was, that she was, she and her friends, had had brought the demon out and and we were the keepers of the keys and it, you know basically my our fault so we had to rectify things <laughs> i find erin voss is such a complex character because on the one level um she's been stuck in her head for 23 years she is someone who has been i guess not has been aging for obviously 23 years but her last memory is or Active memory is when she was much younger, about 20, I think it was, maybe 21. Yeah, 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 in her, in her late teens, about late teens, yeah. So, like, how did you think of performing someone who is both an adult, but also mentally late teens? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, Jeff. I think part of it was um, she was able, when Amelia's character comes to visit, there are moments of, uh, of a little bit of clarity. Like she, she's not completely gone. She's gone, but she's not completely gone. Mm. So, so the challenge was to find these places where um, I, could, I could grasp on and, and try and figure out sort of what's happening. It, you know, it's somewhere in the subconscious that this young woman is, is Rendell's daughter. And, um, but I'm still, the the objective is I still have to bury myself in case Dodge comes back. Like that's mm. that's Aaron's real, you know, to stay in that space. I think the biggest challenge was, um, be, like I didn't have to do a lot of heavy lifting. It's in the writing. It's in the it's in the story itself. Um, initially, uh, Merzi Almos, who was uh, the did a lot of the directing in season two. Um, when I come to the key house initially, I was playing Erin a little bit too youthful. I'm, I'm very kinetic and physical. And she's like, no, no, 18 year olds are way more cool than this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. I gotta, I gotta pull it back and, and, and like find my inner cool. <laughs> so that was, that was really the, the strongest direction that I really needed to, to, to take in, to adjust. Um, but it was such a great, like, you know, there's all of these sort of polarities that are happening and, and such, you know, emotional turmoil. She has a strong need to, to, um, to release Duncan's memories, but she also has such responsibility knowing that everyone has died at this point, up to this point, except for her to get rid of, like she's, she feels responsible. She's got to save and, and protect those kids, mm. but there's also this, this melancholy. And, and, and I think it really came out with Darby. We had this really wonderful, it was so much fun to work with, with uh, Darby in that she's the other woman, but I'm still in my, you know, I look like a middle-aged woman and, and I looked like shit, but you know, <laughs> it was, no, I did. You know, I mean, they, they dressed me in clothing that made me look like it came from a, like we talked about this. It was the clothing has to look like it came from, you know, the Salvation Army. And, you know, it, it, this is a person who's been forgotten, like her family mm. is gone. So, you know, it's, there's this melancholy and nostalgia and this what if, and, and, oh my God, look at myself, what the fuck. And, and, but I still feel like, you know, I'm this, this sense of loss of like all of this time mm. has been, has been, you know, I have to take risk. The character takes responsibility for burying herself, hiding herself. But at the same time, it really stinks for this, Yeah. you know, that, that sense of loss. So it was so wonderful, you know, those nuances to be able to play, but they had initially with, with in, in the first season, they had me like, there were scenes where they didn't know where they, 
wanted this character when she was crying. Like they had me like one tear falling down. They had ugly crying with the snot. Like it was, they just, they didn't know where they wanted it. So that first season for those two episodes, we talk about, you know, the exhaustion of the work. Like Mm. I was wrung out. It was like, okay, we need you to cry again. We need you to like totally lose it, but don't move. Or now we just want the one single tear. And I, there were a couple of times where I was like, yes, I did it. And, and it never made it on to the oh, I was God like, oh, I know, I know. But, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm helping to push the storyline along. It's, it's got to be uh, instead of a blooper reel, a tear reel. So you can show all the different versions of how I, you did it. I would have loved that. I would have loved that. Yeah. But I can't yeah. believe they put that much. I mean, you watch the show and you just take it for granted. But the, the, the fact that there's that much thought and just how you're going to cry is something I yeah. never even would have thought about as an audience. It's, I mean, that's a, yeah. a level of detail I never would have even considered. Well, it, it really, that, that palette, that, that, that quality of sorrow or grief, you know, it, it, it can take it to one dire- it can take the, the scene one direction, it can take it another. And, and really, like, we are just you know, we're meat puppets. We're here to drive the story along. It's, it's not about, yeah, you know, I, I, I will say I knocked it out of the park, but it's not about, (laughs) it's not about me. It's, it's about, you know, how, how is that story crafted and and how Mm. is that told? Well, one of the, um, another great actor that you you played off of was Aaron Ashmore, who plays Duncan Locke. Yeah. And the cool thing about that is that once again, you have to manufacture a huge level of complex history yeah. Considering you just met this actor yeah. and in, in, in the show, you've actually only been on screen for minutes, but you have to convey this long, complex history. How, yeah. how easy is that to do? And how did you pre- prepare to develop that with um, Aaron? Yeah. So Aaron's amazing. I, I just adore Aaron. Aaron is a, is a very well-known Canadian actor as is his twin brother, but I've known, I, I hadn't worked with Aaron, but I've known, you know, of his work. So I knew that when I was going in to, to do this, that, you know, we were just going to, we were just going to have fun. But it, again, it goes back to what's already been established, the backstory, Uh, And knowing that he was the, you know, the little kid that we, you know, you know what the story is. Yes, I do. Right. So, again, that sense of responsibility and that sense of protection and nurturing and and, you know, we all have friends in our lives that we can you know, not, not rely on the memory of those specifics of the friendship, but we have friends in our, in our lives that we go, you know, these are deep, deep friendships that we understand what that is about. Mm. So, I mean, Aaron and I would, you know, we would hang out in between scenes and just kind of like talk and get to know each other. And then it was like, well, you know, where what what's the feel what do you need how can we do this and I think really being uh, you know having an open heart and and really be willing to jump into the pool you know cannonball in and go whatever's going to happen let's go with it and and like just such a terrific person from that standpoint and a terrific actor so you know you find these people where you go I know that I can trust you implicitly and you're going to catch the ball that I'm throwing and I'm going to catch the ball that you're throwing at me and we're going to we're something's going to happen we don't know what but something's going to happen so but again I think it also speaks to the writing. It always goes back to the writing, right? Mm-hmm. When the writing is great, you don't have to muscle through. You, 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 it's, it's easy to, to jump into the sandbox. Well, like, I mean, even being like a servant to the, the writing as an actor, to be able to be that open with another actor like that, I mean, it serves the script so well. And I mean, no matter how good or bad the writing may be, the fact that you and, and, um, um, Aaron can just connect like that and be open and the, I guess the empathy with that had to be yeah. a huge service to the script as well. Well, you hope so. I mean, I, I think that it, I think that it, it, it shows in the work that we've done. I mean, you can tell when people don't have chemistry or they don't particularly like each other. I mean, that's, that's challenging. There are actors who are 
Trump is an asshole. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to get that in. <laughs> time, for, time for a shot, everyone. Um, I mean, th- there, there are actors that you just, you don't get along with, but you know, I think, I think it's one of the special sort of qualities that actors have is that, that they're able to, they're able to access that. Mm. Um, and, and I think one interesting thing about, once again, Erin Voss, is that technically, as you said, she's technically 18, maybe 19. Yeah. She, a lot of the main cast is children who are 16, 17, 18, but yet you're kind of the adult, but at the same time, you're technically mentally their age group. I mean, that's, yeah. that's once again, seems like so many layers to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think, I, I think if one of the things like I would always say is try to keep it simple, mm. you know, if like, yes, in, in my research or my research and, you know, in, in the preparation that I did prior to, I know that that's built in there, but again, what is the driving objective for this character? Mm. And it's find those keys, find that one key and get rid of Dodge and, and open up you know, Duncan's, you know, get, bring him back, give his memories back, Mm. you know, to steal somebody's memories. Oh my God. Like that's, and, and, you know, to know that you caused people's, like you've unleashed the hounds of hell essentially. Like, whoa, that's mind blowing. (laughs) Right. So, you know, I think from an actor's point of view, keep it simple and, and, you know, don't, you know, because if you're thinking about it while you're doing it, it takes you out of the present moment. Mm. And, and you also get to have a, a wicked badass scene in the labyrinth yes. without giving too much away, but, but that yes. scene is so awesome. I mean, how did it feel to just get that moment? Did you feel like a badass in that moment doing it? Oh, I felt like a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. It was so much fun. Griffin is, is an absolute doll. He was like, all right, let's, you know, let's get into it. We had so much fun with that. Um, and again, Halia was part of that, that, uh, that scene. Um, it was wonderful, but he was like, you know, I really had to try and yank this kid. He's, you know, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's no lightweight, but you know, I'm, I'm digging in. It was also one of the coldest nights in, uh, we shot it in, in February. We were down at the waterfront. Um, it was fucking cold. I had like three <laughs> layers of long johns on and, you know, I'm falling into snow. It was, yeah. you know, so it was a, it was a challenging those those kinds of shoots those night shoots in the cold are challenging for everyone involved Mm. but it was like i was like this is you know i know it's short-lived but i almost almost got it (laughs) well how how bittersweet was it because of the what happens in it i mean did you feel like part of you was like nope not it's not gonna make it happen i'm just gonna pretend i'm so i'm so alive everything's good I, i'm texting everyone how is shooting going guys how is shooting going? i miss you guys there's a little bit of that yeah no well um uh meredith uh the, the executive producer she called me and um which was so generous and, and i know they're supposed to do that anyway but sh- she called and said hey listen joy uh i'm i just want to give you a heads up and I'm really sorry, but we're going to kill your character off. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> but, I, but you know, but I knew, you know, she said, it's going to be epic. And I said, as long as it's epic and I can serve the story, but it's perfect storytelling, right? You have mm. this character who, you know, is kind of like fringe character who you feel sorry for that. You don't quite know what's mm. going on with her. You bring her back. you you know, you make everyone kind of, well, I'm, I'm, you know, personifying fall in love with her and and really care for this character and then it's like you kill her yeah so that's great storytelling that that serves the story in in the most sublime manner so i'm proud that i mean i would have liked to have stuck around of course but (laughs) well it's not about me well i'll say like i said i agree with you completely though i will say me and my wife were really pissed off about the whole thing we're like motherfuckers (laughs) (laughs) they they should have done that son of a bitch (laughs) yeah it's one of those things where you're like for like a second you're like you know what fuck this we're done and then it was like, like let's see what happens next yeah, yeah <laughs> you know? i know you're stuck you're totally stuck yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. but it, like i said it's a great scene um obviously the planky it uh, is used i guess it's the show's been yeah. um out for a while so I, whatever spoilers is fine uh the, the planky's been out is, is that fully cgi or was it practical effects so they had um they made this latex suit uh, it was really interesting. So they made this latex suit. It was kind of like a pair of uh, shorts 
that, that I pulled on over my clothes and it was incredibly uncomfortable um, in that if I had to pee, it was like a whole rigmarole of taking everything off. We've talked about this, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, they then brought me to um, uh, a CGI house, a production house where they put me in this, um, they took photos of me in, first of all, they took photos of me, not in the outfit, and then they took photos of me in the outfit at like 360 degrees. And then mm. they put me in this, uh, this machine that was, um, it's like walking into a, a sort of octagonal uh, elevator mm. that had like, like, a, like a room that had, fo- that had cameras all over the place. And they, I would just kind of stand there and they took photos of me. So they utilized that to do the CGI. So it was a combination of practical and actual outfit that they put me in and then more CGI with the, with the vines. How how awkward is that to be in that room, standing there with all the cameras around you spinning and all that? Is that awkward? You're like, okay, change, move, turn, (laughs) turn. (laughs) But it was cool because I think the technology is so interesting for me. I I found it interesting. Hmm. Um, So I was like, Oh, this is neat. This is just another an, another insight into, you know, really how how sophisticated uh, things are in this in in that world. So mm. it, yeah, it's it's gonna be amazing. What they're I mean, I can imagine what it's gonna be like 10, 20, 30 years from now. What they can do with technology. I mean, the thing that uh, this is only the infancy of CGI <laughs> and see what they can do yeah. later. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you look back at certain you know films and you go, wow, mm. that was mind blowing. And then you come back, you know, 10, five, 10, you know, years later and go, oh, but then you go, well, the story, the story stands up. So if the story Mm -hmm. stands up, I think you're a little bit more forgiving of, of the uh, special effects. Yeah. Like what they say, like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, so famous for special effects and having watched it as um, a kid, you know, once again, um, the movie is at that point, like 20 years old, you're like, this was the, the, the peak of his time period, you know, but nowadays you're like, Oh, no, I can see, you know, I can see what they did back then, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, with AI, you you can hear it even with commercials online. They, they you know, they've got, um, they're not even actors. They're, it's, it's computerized, you know, computer generated dialogue for, you know, underlying uh, ads for, for their, their scripts and such. And it's like, I think that, you know, there's there's nothing like uh, in, in that that person to person interface, but it mm. will be very interesting to see, you know, when that bridge is crossed and what how that will what it, that will look like. It'll be interesting. I mean, I, I I would like to think I don't I maybe like to think is maybe not the best phrase, but I, I would like to think that the uncanny valley effect will stop it from being a complete change to CGI uh, without the actor involved because. I do think, I mean, we like to think, especially vocally, visually, the audience will always be able to figure out when it's not a real person. Yeah. Well, you I know? mean, again, you look at, you look at, um, you know, games, uh, video games, right? Mm. So that's motion capture. You've got a, you've got an actor in a, in a suit that's covered in little silver balls and you go into a space, a huge sort of, uh, you know, space that has grids with cameras again, all over the place. And, you know, you become animated. And so there, I think, and I think that you will always need actors. I hope you will always need actors, but I mean, (laughs) I mean, I think that's a good example of how far that technology has gotten. You know, Mm. it's, you even are wearing like the sort of halo headgear with a camera on your face. So it's there, it's based on, you know, what that individual looks like. You're, Mm. You're saying the lines, you're acting and using your imagination for the, whatever the experience is, the scene is, but then it's, you know, it's animated. There's always, mm. I guess we go back to animation in some manner. <laughs> and you know what though? I'm one of those people who just, I prefer the, the hand drawing art versus the CGI animation. The, the Toy Story is a great movie. I always prefer, I think yeah. the hand drawn animation is there's something so beautiful about that artwork. You know? Well, I, I, I think what happens is you have the essence of the artist coming through the paper, mm. the paper coming through that themselves, right? There's, there's not that interface, that two-dimensional interface 
with the computer, the ones and zeros. Mm. There is, there's a, there's an energetic exchange like this. I, it seems very esoteric and kind of woo woo, but I, I really believe that that essence of that artist really comes through in, mm. in, in that artwork. So yeah. you can't, it's very difficult to compare it. I mean, I agree. I mean, that ballroom scene of Beauty and the Beast is so remarkable oh, from the animation. Yeah. Where, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm not, a, you know, Beauty and the Beast on the whole isn't in necessarily in my wheelhouse, but that moment in the ballroom, there's something so beautiful, beautifully singular about that moment. They're just like, it only works in animation, you yeah. know, like it wouldn't be, it just did a CGI, it just wouldn't felt the same. Yeah, yeah, you know? I agree with you. I agree with you. So you mentioned there's more keys in season three of Lock and Key, uh, which means you have some information. Does that also mean Erin Voss somehow appears in season three as well? Maybe as a memory, maybe she's not dead. Maybe that she came back as a plant person, whatever. <laughs> Is it what information can you give me about how Erin Voss returns in season three? So, so phrased the, phrased it. there we go. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm actually out of respect. I'm actually not allowed to talk about season three. I wish I could. I wish I could drop. The only thing I can drop is that I know there are there are um, there are some new keys, and that's really all I can say. Well, so. I'm, I'm just gonna say this. You can you can say what you want. There's it says something maybe that you have that information as Aaron Voss that there's newer keys in season three, and I'm just gonna leave it there and. Maybe that means something. <laughs> Maybe that means that. <laughs> just drop it. There you go. That's all. It's out there. Anyway, I, I, yeah, yeah. So it, what? It was interesting because they did shoot because of COVID. What I can say, which was interesting, usually there is um, a, an hiatus between season and season, but because of COVID, they uh, they shot season two. They sh they shot season three. Uh, back to back. So oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So, so I think I can I can give that uh, information at least. Once again, it may. I'm just gonna suggest so it's the fact that it it happens at the same time. The kids who normally in real life are going to age, the fact yeah. that they're not going to age probably may integrate a, a time frame. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's actually a really good point as well. I mean, you do tend to see in when you talk about episodic and there are family shows and kids. The kids grow right yes. and 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 you see the most marked difference from you know like young kids into teenage kids that's mm. that's usually where it, it's most marked so um i think they caught uh, they caught jackson right right in that sweet spot so <laughs> well good like i said because uh, one thing i was thinking about like uh, the movie eternals where they had that kid in the movie but they at yeah. the end they had to make him I hope I'm not ruining anything. Uh, human to could they explain why he's going to age in three years when they make yeah. the next one or whatever. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. So good. So, but like I said, I look forward to, to Lock and Key season three. Me and my wife will yeah. definitely be binging it probably within the oh. first couple of days that comes out. And right I wanna, on. And I want to thank you so much. You you were fantastic as Aaron Voss. Oh, thank I, you so much. Been a great guest, and I and thank you so much, Joy, for joining me. I appreciate it. I, thank you for bringing me on. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, and. Uh, I look forward to catching your podcasts now in the future. Oh, thank you so much. And when you're um, ready to talk about the next project, come right back on. You're a guest always on the show when you want it. Okay. Can I get, can I give a plug to, uh, I've got, uh, I've got something coming out called Kingswood on Apple okay. that I think is in at some point in the new year. Um, it's based on a Pulitzer prize winning book. It's a huge cast. Uh, it's based on a Pulitzer prize winning book by Sherry Fink called five days at Memorial, um, based on a true story of, uh, hurricane Katrina and, uh, some things that, um, went on in one of the hospitals down there so you can you can watch out for that and so uh, is, is it a, a series or a movie so it is a it's called it's a considered a short-term series it would be what i would call a, a mini series way in back in the day um but again another unbelievable uh project that um, actually, Carlton Cuse, who is one of the executive producers on Lock and Key, is also uh, producing, uh, pro executive producer on Kingswood, um, along with uh, Ridley. John Ridley. John Ridley's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so who do you play? Uh, I play a, a nurse named Jill. Uh, in a and I'm in the private I'm a, in the private sector and uh, it's it's like a it's a disaster it's like a disaster movie and it, and it was quite remarkable what they did so 
Well, uh, when it's ready to air and I get to watch some episodes, you're welcome to come back on to talk about it. I would actually enjoy that very much. Like I said, you're a guest whenever you want. <laughs> oh, Jeff, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think what together should we like end this with the, our little mantra drinking game? Trump is Trump an is asshole. An asshole.